An apartment building and a factory have been shelled as Russia's assault on Kyiv continues. And Ukraine will demand an immediate ceasefire during another round of talks with Moscow. Giles Gibson joins us live now from Riga in Latvia. Giles, the UK Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, he's preparing to host a series of meetings with leaders uh, at this summit with uh, uh, Nordic and Baltic leaders specifically. Uh, he wants to boost European resilience as far as Ukraine is concerned. What can we expect, though, from this meeting? How is it going to help Ukraine? Yeah, on Tuesday, Boris Johnson is hosting the leaders from countries who are members of uh, something called the Joint Expeditionary Force, or JEF. This is made up of uh, 10 <coughs> countries in Northern Europe. Uh, it's led by the United Kingdom, but it also has members including uh, Denmark and Sweden uh, and Latvia, where I am. It can act independently uh, to respond to crises in the region, or it also can act as a part of a NATO force. Uh, what we're expecting after this meeting is for uh, these countries to pledge to hold uh, more military exercises uh, in the North Atlantic as well as in the Baltic Sea. So this is uh, less about any direct action inside Ukraine and more about sending a message to Vladimir Putin that he should not be threatening any of their members, any NATO member countries who are on the northern borders of Russia. And Giles, Latvia's parliament voted unanimously earlier this month to allow its citizens to volunteer for military service in Ukraine. Do we know how many have volunteered so far? And if that number is going to make a difference uh, in terms of Ukraine's military strength? Yeah, we don't have an exact breakdown of how many Latvian citizens have decided to volunteer and go and fight, against, uh, fight alongside the Ukrainians against uh, the Russian invasion. We have heard, though, that one member of the Latvian parliament has actually volunteered uh, and is now travelling to Ukraine uh, to do his part. I mean, walking around uh, the Latvian capital, Riga, you just see so many signs of solidarity with Ukraine. Lots of people putting up flags outside their houses. Uh, I've seen some sort of gatherings of candles with the Ukrainian uh, colours as well, blue and yellow. So there is a real sense here suddenly, a real awareness of the fact that Latvia also has a border along its east with Russia in the wake of the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, in terms of how these uh, foreign fighters are going to affect the actual conflict, I think we can see them more as part of the, you know, the information war, the public relations war in this, because we actually had at the end of last week, Vladimir Putin uh, responding to uh, this news that Vladimir Zelensky had invited foreign fighters to come and fight alongside Ukrainian forces. We had Vladimir Putin claiming that there are 16,000 volunteers in the Middle East who are ready and willing to sign up and fight alongside the Russians. Uh, no independent verification of that, though. Giles, thank you for that update. Giles Gibson there in Riga, Latvia. Our top Chinese diplomat Yang Jiechi has met U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in Rome. The crisis in Ukraine, top of their agenda. Olivia Xiong joins us live from Beijing. Olivia, talks have begun. Any major outcomes so far? Well, so far, we haven't heard very much out of these talks that are taking place in Rome, except for an hour ago, we saw Chinese state media confirm uh, that the senior Chinese diplomat, Yang Jiechi, has indeed met U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. But other than that, we do not know very much more about the progress of these talks and likely we'll have to wait for statements to be issued by both countries at the end of these high-level meetings. Um, but what we do know is that last night, when this meeting was announced, the Chinese side said that uh, these talks were meant to implement the consensus that had been reached by Chinese President Xi Jinping and his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden when they met in a virtual summit in November and said that they would be discussing regional and international issues of mutual concern. In that statement by the foreign ministry, there had been no explicit mention of Ukraine, uh, pointing to how China has really been treading very carefully 
around this issue. But today, when asked about this, the foreign ministry did confirm that Ukraine would be on the agenda. But the big question, though, is how much can be achieved from these talks, given the tensions that we are seeing between the two countries? Now, we have seen U.S. media reports say that China had been asked by Russia to provide military assistance in Ukraine. Now, this is something that China has refuted. Its embassy in Washington, when asked about this, said it did not know about this matter, also saying that the top priority was to prevent tensions from escalating. Now, the Kremlin has also uh, come out to say that it did not ask China for any sort of military assistance. Uh, the Chinese foreign ministry, when asked today about this at its daily briefing, had even harsher words for the U.S. 近期美方在乌克兰问题上接二连三地散布针对中国的虚假信息，用心险恶。Now, besides calling those accusations of being asked for military assistance disinformation, China said that its position was consistent and it wanted to play a constructive role in ensuring uh, and promoting peace talks between Ukraine and Russia. Olivia, you say it's a consistent position, but it is a position that China has been very carefully calibrating Russia and Ukraine. Is it showing any signs of shifting on that position? Well, there is certainly something that the U.S. going into these talks would want to see along with the European Union. Uh, countries have been calling on China to take a stand against Russia and to use its influence uh, to reign in Russia and reign in Moscow and trying to put an end to this war in Ukraine and for China to play the role as mediator. But as we know, China has so far refused to condemn Russia's actions. It's also talked about its rock-solid friendship with Russia and how that this is a cooperation uh, that has no limits between the two countries. And observers so tell me that it's quite unlikely that we will be seeing a shift in the uh, position uh, of China. Uh, but that China may take a wait-and-see approach instead. Also, given that tensions with the U.S. continue to remain high, not just over Ukraine, but also in other areas, for example, over the self rule island of Taiwan. And today, over sanctions, we know that going into this meeting, the U.S. National Security Advisor has said that it has warned China that uh, prior to this meeting that it will face consequences if it helps Russia to uh, go around any sort of the sanctions that have been placed on it. Um, in response to this, we saw the Chinese foreign ministry head back again at this, repeating that China does not support the use of sanctions. It called this long-arm jurisdiction, saying that this is not an effective method. Also saying that China would do its utmost to protect the rights of individuals and uh, its Chinese companies when it came down to it. Also, we've seen China double down on accusations that have been pushed by Russia, accusing the U.S. of funding biological weapons labs in Ukraine. Now, this is something that the U.S. on its part has said is disinformation. The U.N. also said that it has not received any information on that. But today, the Chinese foreign ministry continuing to push this narrative, calling for the U.S. to accept an independent investigation into this. Oh, thanks, Olivia. Olivia Xiong in Beijing, they're laying out China's position as high-level U.S. and Chinese talks take place in Rome. Live now to Singaporean Ix Shen. He was in Kyiv for several months with his wife. She is Ukrainian. He joins us tonight now from Warsaw. Ix, thanks for joining us. You were in Krakow. What was the situation like there, and, and how much are they struggling with this influx of refugees that they've seen? Um, personally, I didn't see any sign of struggling. I, I see the city coping rather well because um, they, I, I've seen the schools being detonated as tempor temporary dormitories. I see stadiums are trying to process all these incoming Ukrainians. And I see a lot of, they have free train passage for any Ukrainian passport holders for them to move on to other cities or other, other parts of Europe as well. So it's actually an ongoing process. Perhaps struggling in terms of uh, welfare, uh, providing welfare in terms of lodging, uh, food and uh, housing and everything else. This might be a strain on the city, but then again, I'm speaking on my own. I'm not 
I'm not in touch with the city administration to answer all these questions. Well, Ix, you were in uh, in Warsaw. Tell us about that journey. I mean, you were. Was it? Is it very different between the two cities, though? Um, I have just arrived into Warsaw. I still haven't entered the city center, so um, we're still setting up meetings with uh, about the whole situation and to gather information. Um, when I first arrived into Warsaw, uh, about three days ago. Um, it was very crowded. There were people sitting on the floor waiting for transportation or waiting for their documents to be processed before they can decide what's the next course of action. At, at places whereby it's a hub for all these um, Ukrainians who are transiting or arriving, yes, um, it's very crowded and um, it's not chaotic. It's very well organized. There are a lot of volunteers, a lot of police. Everything is very Orderly, it's just very crowded with a lot of people. All right, Ix, thank you very much. We appreciate your daily updates. Ix Shen there, please stay safe.